Hello, and welcome to the Origins Podcast. I'm Lawrence Krauss. What's left to say about Noam Chomsky? He's known throughout the world as perhaps the most important living public intellectual, and his writing has been cited more than almost any author in the arts and humanities over recent decades, and he's literally the father of modern linguistics. Noam served as a role model for me since I took a class from him in U.S. foreign policy while doing my PhD in physics at MIT, and I watched him speak throughout Cambridge with generosity and intelligence. We did a dialogue on stage three years ago for the Origins Project, and we discussed a host of things from language and consciousness to politics. That was before Donald Trump and Brexit and all that, however, and I was happy to have the opportunity to update our dialogue. As always, he was incisive, informative, provocative, and brilliant, as well as providing a unique treatment of issues one simply does not hear discussed in the U.S. media, making it incredibly important to hear from him today. Patreon subscribers can find the full video of this program immediately at patreon.com slash origins podcast. I hope you enjoy the show. Noam, it's great to have you back here. We, you and I had one of my favorite conversations before the public, I think three years ago now. It's Three seems, years? I think it seems, it's hard to believe. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I, I time it by knowing that it was before Trump was elected. So I, because it seems, that's what, what's amazing. In three short years, it seems like so much has happened. It's yeah, so many, BT and... B, oh, AT, and AT, AT, that's right, exactly. <laughs> and... Uh, it, it, but that's not just all Trump. It, I mean, look, all the things happen. There's what's happened in North Korea and Syria and Israel and Venezuela and Brazil. Brazil. All and, over. Uh, uh, it's just amazing that what seems to have happened in those three years and it, even in our own countries. There's there's free speech debates. There's all sorts of things. And I will want to talk about some of that. But at the same time, the more things change, the more they remain the same. So there's all sorts of new issues. But But the underlying causes and impact may not be so different. I wanted to, and you know, when I was thinking about that, I I, for, I was looking at what we said to each other, and, and then I re- was reminded of a book I had been reading uh, recently, which is an old book from the 1960s by Richard Hofstadter called Anti-Intellectualism in America. And, and it was interesting for me to read that because it was written in response to McCarthyism. It was written in 1961 or so. And I thought I'd begin to put this in context, in a quote at the beginning of that book from 1961, where he quoted Emerson, who wrote, let us honestly state the facts. Our America has a bad name for superficialness. Great men, great nations have not been boasters and buffoons, but perceivers of the terror of life and have manned themselves to face it. So I thought I'd ask you to comment on that, on that and, then, and then we can move into recent politics. Well, uh, Emerson was a very interesting thinker, but uh, in many respects, he uh, unfortunately uh, illustrated the things that he's criticizing. I agree. So take, for example, uh, something not irrelevant today, his attitude toward the Civil War. At the very beginning, he was a pacifist. In fact, he was, uh, in a sense, in favor of the war. He thought it would break down the states. It would break down state power, so maybe it would be beneficial. Uh, after the Battle of Bull Run, he became an a, a enthusiastic a super patriot, uh, very much the way intellectuals do all the time. As soon as the conflict begins, we're, we're enthusiasts for our own side. Mm-hmm. In fact, if you look back at the transcendentalists, his group, uh, mm-hmm. Some of the most distinguished intellectuals in the United States, certainly, maybe anywhere, uh, one uh, didn't go along with the tide, uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne. Uh And he was kind of uh, excluded. In fact, there's a very interesting article you might want to read if you have it in the uh, Atlantic Monthly. Uh, Hawthorne, towards the end of the war, about 1964, uh, 1864, 1864, uh, decided to uh, just travel through the South to see. By then, the outcome of the war was reasonably clear. Uh And uh, he wrote an article which was uh, supportive of the North, uh, you know, 
uh, but skeptical. For example, he interviewed uh, prison, Southern prisoners of war in a fairly sympathetic way. He said, look, these are just rural farmers. Uh, they're not war criminals. They were uh, brought up uh, to defend their homes and so on. We should treat them decently. Anyway, the interesting thing about the article is not only his commentary, which is interesting, but the interpolations. Mm -hmm. Uh, the editors agreed to have it published, but only if they were allowed, and this is a liber the liberal sure. intellectual journal, yeah. if they were allowed to interpolate comments uh, criticizing what he wrote along the way. Huh. So there you have Hawthorne's moderately sympathetic view to people who are defeated and suffering, and the liberal intellectuals interpolating, so no, you have to be a super patriot. You can't say these things. It's, it's very instructive about uh, intellectual history in many yeah. ways. In fact, if you look at the history of intellectuals, it works very much like this. So shortly after this period came uh, the Dreyfus trial, mm -hmm. uh, which actually is the first time that the word intellectual starts being used in its modern sense. And uh, it's very interesting that we, we, today we honor the Dreyfus arts, Emil Zoli and so on. Sure. Not then. They were bitterly attacked by the uh, immortals of the Académie Française. Uh, uh, how dare you uh, mere writers and artists uh, criticize our grand institutions, you know, the state, uh, so on. Uh, fast for uh, Zola actually had yeah. to flee the country. Yeah, sure. Uh, let's go forward to... Not long before we met, late 60s, uh -huh. uh, 66, 67, roughly then, uh, McGeorge Bundy, uh, former Harvard dean, mm -hmm. leading intellectual national security advisor for uh, uh, Kennedy and Johnson, had an article in Foreign Affairs, the main establishment journal, in which he uh, said, he discussed the criticism of the Vietnam War. He said, yes, there are legitimate criticisms. Uh, about the tactics and so on. And then there are what he called the wild men in the wings, uh, people like uh, Hawthorne and Zola, who are not only criticizing the tactics, but are raising questions about our motives. I assume you were one of the wild men in the wings. Oh, yeah. Absolutely, <laughs> yeah. very far out in the wings. And, and this is a theme that runs through basically all of history. You go back to classical Greece, uh, uh, who drank the hemlock, uh, the guy who was corrupting the youth of Athens by asking too many questions yeah. uh, right up to the present. It's, uh, and so it's interesting to raise the question of Emerson, who was a very distinguished, uh, honorable figure, but not immune. Well, no, I, 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 I like that quote because of the many-sided aspects of it, because of his background, and also this notion, of course, uh, great nations have not been bolsters and buffoons, which sort of resonates in some ways in the current times. But this and this idea of whether anti-intellectualism has been prevalent and to what extent it's good or bad. Um, it's a good question. And, and, yeah. So, for example, the, there are several kinds of intellectuals. There's the wild men in the wings and there are the what are sometimes called the stenographers of power. Yeah. And uh, one has to make up one's own mind, but I think you can certainly have different attitudes towards them. Well, you know, I, I, we were talking about lunch that I learned uh, f from you when the first time we met, when which was when I was sitting in, of course, an American foreign policy when I was a student at MIT. Um, a, a shocking fact, which to me just surprised me because I'd always kind of revered academia and I've, it's been a part of my life ever since. But the realization that in some ways during the Vietnam War, the last group to accept the immorality of that war was were the academics, which which I, I always thought, maybe because I knew of you, but I, I'd always thought somehow the academics were leading it. But it was the students, it was the public. Maybe you can go into a little bit. Well, I would broaden it beyond academics to the general intellectual community, uh, with some exceptions. There always are the sure. Emil Zolos and yes. the Nathaniel Hawthorne. And the Noam Chomskys. And others. <laughs> but uh, uh, by and large, it's true. In fact... Uh, you get a kind of a vivid picture of it. Well, uh, first of all, remember that opposition to the war was very late in coming. Uh, the, uh, the war actually started in the early 50s. Uh, by 1960, maybe um, 60 or 70,000 
people had been killed in South Vietnam mm-hmm. just by repress, the repressive government we were supporting. Uh, Kennedy escalated the war in 1961 and 62. He uh, authorized the U.S. Air Force to start uh, bombing rural South Vietnam under South Vietnamese markings, but nobody was fooled. Uh-huh. Uh, authorized napalm uh, began, and this was very serious, uh, chemical warfare to destroy crops and livestock, to try to drive the uh, rural population into concentrated areas called strategic hamlets where they were being protected against the guerrillas who uh, the U.S. government knew very well they were supporting. We know this from internal documents that have been released. Uh, There was no protest, none. None. Uh, uh, In fact, just to give you an example, when... uh, uh, 1965, I guess, I was, uh, four, six, 64, 65, uh, I happened to be spending a year at Harvard. I was a visiting fellow in Cognitive Science Center. Uh, uh, 19, February 1965, uh, the war against South Vietnam had already half destroyed the country, but the U.S. escalated the war to the north. And the individual who was primarily responsible for this was McGeorge Bundy, uh-huh. national you recall, after yeah. Pleiku and so on. Yeah. Uh, a couple of students. Uh, uh, Bundy was being uh, invited, had been invited, to be the commencement speaker at the June uh, commencement for Harvard. And a couple of students uh, initiated a very mild petition asking whether it's right to invite someone who's just uh, launched a war against another country without provocation. Uh, since I was there, they asked me to see if I could get some faculty signatures. <laughs> uh, virtually impossible. That was 1965. By that time, the war was already far advanced. Uh, in fact, in October 1965, Uh, There was uh, an international day of protest. Uh, You were probably in elementary school at the time, so you didn't know about it. (laughs) Yeah, I was still in elementary school and in Canada. That was also made. (laughs) But it was an international day of protest. It's interesting because, you know, so so this was 65. Yeah, because one thinks of the protests as being later, of course, but already, and maybe the American media, maybe you're going to get there. Well, what happened is interesting. I'm talking about Boston, maybe the most liberal city in the country. Yeah. Uh, We decided to try to have a demonstration in Boston to join the international demonstrations. Uh Uh, We went to the Boston Common, you know, the standard place. I was supposed to be one of the speakers. Totally broken up by counter-demonstrators, mostly students, incidentally, coming to smash up this demonstration. Uh, The Boston Globe, maybe the most liberal paper in the country, you look at the front page the next day, it was denouncing the demonstrators. How dare you? Uh, uh, very much like the immortals of the Académie Française. Just, how yeah. dare you uh, attack our noble institutions and so on. This is October 1965. Uh, by then, uh, there was another international day of protest in May, in uh, March, I think, 1966. Uh, we decided we can't have a public meeting. We'll have a meeting in the church, Arlington Street Church. Church was attacked. Mm-hmm. At that time, Vietnam had literally almost been destroyed. At that, just to give in, uh, Bernard Fall, who mm-hmm. was the most respected uh, military historian, Vietnam expert, uh, no dove, incidentally, mm-hmm. but cared about the Vietnamese. Uh, he wrote at that time... Uh, that uh, he doubted that Vietnam would survive as a cultural and historical entity under the most serious attack that had ever been launched against an area that size, words roughly like that. Hmm. Uh, That was at the point when we, in the liberal city of Boston, we couldn't have a demonstration in a church without it being attacked. Well, after that, finally, uh, 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 an opposition movement developed, mostly young people, students, and so on. But let's fast forward up to 1975 when the war ended. Uh, as soon as the war formally ended, of course, everyone had to write about it. Yeah, yeah. What, what did it mean? And uh, you look across the spectrum of public opinion, uh, expressions, public media, yeah. major media, mm-hmm. and uh, they kind of break up into the hawks and the doves. So, roughly, the hawks saying, uh, 
We were stabbed in the back. Uh, we didn't fight hard enough. Uh, if we'd fought harder, we could have won yeah. and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, the doves are always much more interesting. They <laughs> set the kind of limits of uh, possible thought yeah. this far, but not a but millimeter <laughs> farther. <laughs> So you go way to the end, say Anthony Lewis, the yeah. New York Times, strong critic of the war. Yeah, I remember, civil libertarian. I remember. Mm -hmm. A very interesting article. He uh, said, uh, the war began, he said, with blundering efforts to do good. Uh, blundering because it didn't work uh, to do good because that's a tautology. Yeah. You don't give arguments for that. That's <laughs> kind of like saying two plus two equals four. Yeah. He's not a wild man in the wings. Yeah. You know, so. He said by 1969, it was clear that it was a disaster. Uh, we could not bring democracy to Vietnam at a cost acceptable to ourselves. So it was really a terrible mistake. Now, up to the present, about as far as you can go to the critical side is to say it was a mistake. Very interestingly, at that point, uh, public opinion was being carefully sampled. The Chicago Council on Foreign Relations does extensive yes, studies of public yeah. opinion, mm -hmm. very scholarly. Mm -hmm. uh, they're 1965, 66, roughly then. Their report uh, also, of course, asked questions about what you think about the Vietnam War. And the answers were interesting. Uh, about 70% of the population said it was not a mistake. It was fundamentally wrong and immoral. Now, that question kept being asked for another 15 years or so, up to about roughly 1990. The answers were all approximately the same. Uh, they stopped asking it after a while. Yeah. The last time they asked it, the uh, distinguished social scientist, serious social scientist who was in charge of the surveys, uh, John Reilly, asked the question in the comments, uh, what do people mean when they say this? And he said, well, what they mean is uh, too many American lives were being lost. <laughs> well, that's possible. You yeah. know, would have been possible to find out yeah. by asking another question. Exactly. But, but the other possible answer, namely they meant what they were saying, is just unthinkable. Totally discounted. And, you well, know, this is the history of intellectuals. Well, you know, okay, well, and we'll come back to that because I want to circle around to that eventually in a different context. But let, let's, and one of the reasons I was happy to start with historical perspective is, of course, it's always, it's always good to, to look at the present in that context. I was just reading a, what is now one of my favorite quotes of Mark Twain, who said that history may not repeat itself, but it sure rhymes a lot. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, um, I want to talk about, the, in that context, what's happening around the world, both what's really happening and the perceptions of what's really happening from domestically to foreign wise we i mean we could talk for hours about that but we'll see if we can limit this okay. but let's pick let's pick what's going on um you pick your favorite we could start with uh, you know venezuela we could start with north korea we could start with israel or trump i want to i want to sort of sort of go through these and see what what uh what we're hearing and 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 what's really there because this notion of american exceptionalism which just seems to be so prevalent part of it is the notion which, which again brings me back to when I when I first met you to this notion that somehow the United States is different because we always want to do good. Other countries have been imperial powers, but their intentions were not to do good. And I remember you asked saying at the time that if you asked a five year old, is it likely that America's foreign policy is governed by anything different than anyone else throughout all of history? They'd say it's unlikely. But somehow the perception is that intentionality is that the United States really is altruistic and the, and its interventions around the world which may have been had had bad consequences were really well intended but they were misplaced and i and i kind of still get i still kind of see that in in the interpretation of much much of what's going on so well blundering efforts to do good yeah yeah and uh, notice that the 5 year old uh, who you invented yeah. agreed with uh, 70% of the population at the end of the vietnam war so so let's take Today's newspapers. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there's an article by uh, David Sanger in uh -huh. New York Times, the leading yeah. one of the leading uh, mm -hmm. uh, security analysts. Yeah, uh, sure. It was a, in, an article about how to deal with uh, the Russian uh, aggression, the new new forms of Russian aggression and intervention, and uh, there's some interesting lines in it. So, for example, there's a sentence, uh, not just somewhere in the middle, nothing special, saying. Uh, 
it's about time for he's quoting somebody correct positively as yeah. saying uh, it's time for NATO to enhance its defensive capacities at the Russian border. Does that strike anyone as funny? I mean, is the Warsaw Pact uh, enhancing its defensive uh, actions at the Mexico border? Yeah, yeah. Well, no, we're exceptional. If we happen to have forces uh, at the uh, Russian border, that's because it's defensive. Uh, If we have uh, ABM installations at the Russian border, which do actually have dual-use capacities. Of course. And uh, there's an article in the Bulletin, the Atomic yes. Scientist, lead article by Theodore Postel recently yeah. pointing that out. Yeah, and sure. even if they're defensive, that's a first strike weapon. Of course. It's, uh, it's I mean, no it's one of the concerns, yeah, as, yeah. as being so involved in the Bulletin. So that's fine. Time, that's what yeah. I've been concerned and about. And we have them there, as President Obama said, uh, in order to protect Europe from Iranian missiles which don't exist. Exactly. That always uh, amazed me about this notion that we were protecting Europe from missiles that don't exist, whereas it just so happens that we're all... But it's defensive, notice, at the Russian border. At the Russian border. It so happens they're they're pointing at the... Potentially at the... the, Yeah, yeah, exactly. If I were... But you won't see a comment about this, I'm sure, because it's it's kind of common sense. It's a... and then, well, I mean, you know, the first when you say that, of course, one thinks about whether whether maybe putting missiles in Cuba might have been defensive. Well, in <laughs> fact, it was. Yeah. We, we, there's very good scholarship on this by now, uh-huh. and it's pretty well agreed by mainstream scholarship what the reasons were for Khrushchev to make this uh, very reckless move. Uh, there were basically uh-huh. two. Uh-huh. Uh, one was just what you said. Yeah. Uh, the United States was carrying out a major terrorist war against Cuba, a very serious terrorist war. Sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if the Russians may not have known the details, but they certainly roughly knew what was yeah. going on, certainly Cuba did. In uh, August 1962, uh, Kennedy uh, issued a national security memorandum which called on the terrorist operations, Operation Mongoose, to be enhanced leading to an effort to create an insurrection in Cuba, which would lead to U.S. intervention in October 1962. Well, that's when the missiles went in. I don't think Castro and Khrushchev read the internal yeah, documents, un- but you could see what was happening on the ground. That's one reason. There was another. Uh, in the, uh, Khrushchev, when he took, took office... Mm-hmm. Uh, recognized something pretty obvious, that uh, uh, the Russia could not compete economically yeah. with the United States. Mm-hmm. And the United States is far more advanced. Yeah. In fact, Western Europe alone counterbalanced Russia easily, yeah. let alone the United States and Canada. Uh, so what he urged was uh, a reduction, a mutual reduction in offensive weapons uh, uh, in order to allow Russia to move towards economic development. Uh-huh. Uh, the Kennedy administration considered this, rejected it, and instead, though they knew they were way ahead militarily, uh-huh. launched the biggest uh, arms buildup in history. Yeah, it was a very exact. And uh, uh, shortly after this, uh, uh, one of the reasons for Khrushchev's uh, placing the missiles in Cuba was to try to somehow minimally balance this. Uh, Notice, incidentally, that there was a crucial issue that almost led to nuclear war. Uh, The United States had, was surrounding Russia with uh, missiles, with nuclear weapons, of course. That's like our defensive uh, behavior at the Russian border, uh, including uh, missiles in Turkey, uh, um, Jupiter missiles in Mm. Turkey. And uh, Kennedy actually didn't know about this. Uh, he made some comment uh, to Bundy saying it was, it's as if we had missiles in Turkey. And yeah. Bundy said, well, Mr. President, <laughs> <what do> we <laughs> turned out they were obsolete missiles. Uh-huh. A withdrawal order was already in process because uh-huh. they were being replaced by essentially invulnerable uh, Polaris uh, uh-huh. submarines. Uh-huh. So much more lethal and yeah. invulnerable. So they were being replaced. They're obsolete. Mm-hmm. Uh, Khrushchev put missiles in Cuba to sort of try to nowhere near a balance, yeah. but to compensate slightly for the overwhelming 
U.S. advantage and its refusal to, uh, not only refusal to go along with his offer to reduce missiles, but uh, weapons, but even enhancing them. Uh, through the crisis, as you recall, this issue of the missiles in Turkey became critical. Yeah. October 27th, uh, peak moment of the crisis, uh, Khrushchev uh, actually wrote a letter to Kennedy saying, let's get out of this before we blow the world up. Uh, uh -huh. uh, we'll remove the missiles from Cuba. You remove the missiles from Turkey. We'll do it publicly and it'll all be over. Uh, at that time, Kennedy's subjective estimate of the probability of nuclear war was reported to be about a half, a third to a half, you know, not utterly outlandish. It's yeah. so hideous. Yeah. He refused. Uh, uh, this is considered his, and then Khrushchev basically backed down. Yeah. So they made a kind of a secret agreement, but yeah. nothing public. Yeah, we, a secret agreement. The is meaning great. is we have a right to keep in on the Russian border obsolete missiles, which we're replacing by even more lethal ones, but they don't have a right to have anything anywhere near us. Uh, very similar to today. So uh, we have the right to enhance our defensive uh, capabilities on the Russian border, which are already enormous. But if the Russians dare to send anything to Venezuela, we're going to blow the world up. History rhymes. Exactly. And it's, it's useful to think about it. Yeah, well, in fact, I was. it's a nice segue. I'm glad you, because I was going to go to Venezuela. But at the same time, I, it's also worth mentioning that... Um, in terms that the United States also was very, uh, by that point, it, 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 I think it had, it, it had subsided. But the United States, especially during the period of extreme military superiority, were very seriously considered first strikes as, a, oh, as yeah. a, in order to. We've to never say, renounced first. Yeah, strikes. yeah, we've never renounced first strikes. Most people don't realize that we still have that. We've never said we won't strike first. Uh, um, uh, uh, but what we've, but at the time, there were serious discussions of a real first strike in order to before Russia. Uh, or the Soviet, then Soviet Union was able to catch up. and uh, uh, Well, these, Dan Ellsberg's book, which I'm sure you read. Uh, well, that's a, later on my list, oh, but yeah, okay. yeah. In fact, I read it because of you, so I want to come back to that, <laughs> okay. so we'll come back. That's but I think clever. you made the perfect segue, because I wanted to hit Ven Venezuela. In this concept, I mean, here we are doing, trying to quote-unquote, at least if you read the papers, do good in Venezuela, we're, we're, and and uh, whether it's blundering or not. So so I would like to hear your perspective of our of our. Uh, doing goodness in Venezuela? Well, what we're doing in Venezuela is uh, imposing extraordinarily harsh sanctions, uh, which are cutting off virtually the entire income of the country and strangling the population. Uh, the population's opposed to the sanctions. Uh, the leading uh, economist of the opposition, a serious economist, uh, Francisco Rodriguez, one mm -hmm. of the most serious commentators on this, uh, he's opposed to the sanctions. He says they're turning a serious problem into an utter catastrophe. Uh, but we keep doing it uh, because we're trying to do good. Uh, we want to put into power our own guy, uh, Guaido. Nothing much is known about him except that uh, he's a strong supporter of uh, the neo-fascist uh, Bolsonaro who was just installed next door in yeah, we'll Brazil. Get to Brazil. That's another yeah, story. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, there are all kind of criticisms of the Maduro government, which are quite legitimate. Yeah, I was going to say, but, one uh, should criticize. I mean, that government is, well, is not— I think a, it's very repressive. It's carrying yeah. out horrible economic policies. a lot wrong with it. But uh, why do we have the right to uh, impose um, the government of our choice by strangling the population into uh, submission? Well, there's nothing new there. I mean, we try. that's what we try and do in Iran, right? I mean, We're and, doing and, the same and, thing in Iran? I mean, the idea is the po who's getting hurt by, by sanctions in Iran? Well, the population. But yeah. what, again, what right do we have to do that? In fact, you could ask the same question about China. Uh, it's taken for granted across the board, I can't find an exception, that it's legitimate for the United States and Europe, in fact, mostly the United States, to try to impede China's economic development. Uh, they're moving forward. They're trying to move forward with a particular form of yeah. economic development. Uh, say, we don't like the way they're doing it, so yeah. we'll try to block their economic development. Is that legitimate? Well, in fact, there are other questions. The sticking point 
in the negotiations right now, according to Trump, as uh, intellectual property rights. Uh, they are uh, not observing uh, intellectual property rights. What that means is uh, exorbitant uh, patent restrictions, radically uh, opposed to free trade, built into the World Trade Organization system to protect U.S. corporations. So we want Bill Gates to be the richest man in the world. So therefore, there's a essentially monopoly for windows. Uh, pharmaceutical prices have to go out of sight. So therefore, there's huge patent uh, uh, restrictions on uh, for pharmaceuticals. Suppose China decided not to observe them. Who suffers? Well, Bill Gates will have a little less money. Uh, users of uh, computers will be able to find better programs than Windows. Uh, pharmaceutical corporations, instead of having you know trillions of dollars, will only have a few trillions. Uh, um, people will be able to buy cheaper drugs. Uh, I mean, it's argued that this would cut back innovation. But if you look into it, that's not the way innovation takes place. Uh, take, say, Windows. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't have to tell you. The development of computers, software, internet, and so on, that was all a taxpayer, most of it a taxpayer expense for decades. Uh -huh. The same with pharmaceuticals. Huge. There's a good reason why if you walk around MIT, uh, you see... Uh, uh, pharmacy, you see, Pfizer, yeah, uh, you know, yeah, all artists, they're all there kind of feeding off the uh, uh, the creative uh, scientific work done at the laboratories, uh, mostly at government expense. If you'd gone back there 50 years ago, you would have seen Raytheon. Uh, uh, when I was a student then, there, Raytheon, yeah, that, Raytheon it, that, so, those were the big... And that's because electronics was kind of the cutting edge of the economy. Yeah. yeah. Now it's biology. So. Yeah. But, and this is at every research university in the country, not just MIT. Sure. So, so going back to China and the intellectual property, why should they uh, observe the intellectual property rights which are rammed through by uh, the United States and other rich countries? And now let's look at a little history. H how did England develop? By stealing technology from more advanced countries like India or the low countries, even mm -hmm. Ireland. Uh -huh. uh, How did the United States develop? By stealing technology from India, from uh, England. Uh, that's why we got a textile industry, yeah. a steel industry, and so on. Of course, it wasn't called stealing then. It was just uh, that's the way you develop. Uh, every single developed country has developed that way. Uh, then comes something that uh, economic historians call uh, kicking away the ladder. Uh, first you climb the ladder, then you kick it away so nobody else can do it. Uh -huh. Well, that's kind of what lies behind all of this lies behind the uh, effort to try to impede Chinese economic development by things like demanding uh, intellectual property rights. Do you see any discussion of this? I, not in the mainstream media that I can. Yeah, I mean, of course, yeah. you can find some. Yeah, like yeah. Dean Baker, a yeah. good economist, he writes about it. But it's basically out of, off the agenda. So, now, I, since one would assume that, oh, well, since America isn't exceptional, except sometimes maybe exceptionally bad in certain cases, but but, um, but well, what's happened? But um, is that is the reverse happening? I mean, and is, and how does the United States respond? I mean, I assume other countries are trying to do the same thing in the United States, impede economic progress in the United States. It's rational. There's a couple of things wrong with the concept of American exceptionalism. Mm -hmm. The one is the facts. You know. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. The other is. It's not American. Yeah. Every great power has had the same exceptionalism. Uh, Britain, when it was virtually genocidal all over the world, was praising itself on its magnificence. Sure. Uh, I mean, there's, it's, uh, it's, France Rome. had the civilized mission. Well, yeah. the uh, French minister of war was calling on the army to exterminate the population of Algeria. Uh, if we had records from Attila the Hun, he would probably be just uh, over, <laughs> yeah. overwhelmed with uh, good, good. The good fact will. that every country has thought that they've been the unique source of goodness, and uh, you know, because of their so powers, it's, but there's that's, nothing exceptional about American but, exceptional. Though. Well, but since it isn't exceptional, what about is the reverse? You give me examples. Are are other countries? I mean, other countries are trying to assumedly impede American economic progress, and what's the response here? 
how can they impede American economics? Well, well, I guess though. I mean, let me let me just uh, let me give you. I'm not an economist. My ignorance is going to show here, but I'm assuming you for should example, know better than to judge accept <laughs> specialist judgments. Yeah, I know exactly. <laughs> but um, I mean, to some extent, China can impede American progress by being able to produce the same goods and services much more cheaply. But than, than, who's producing them in China? U.S. corporations who want to function China. work in China. Yeah. If U.S. corporations don't like Chinese rules, they can invest somewhere else. I mean, if went, anybody, by the way, there was an article in today's uh, New York Times that said exactly that, right? It was, the response to some of the pressure from Trump, one might say is, it, I don't know if you saw this article, but it was basically saying there's some impact to what's going on and some companies are, are stopping having made things in China, but what they're doing is not bringing back the United States. Yeah. They're just finding another place of to course. do it. Yeah. Which is, yeah. But, but the idea that it's unfair for China to impose uh, technology transfer restrictions or partial ownership restrictions on, say, Boeing, uh, is it's, it's not a question of national policy. If Boeing doesn't like that, nobody's forcing them to invest there. Yeah. Okay. So... What right do we have to punish them for trying to do that? Okay. Uh, quite apart from the fact that the whole his that's how we develop, how England developed, how everybody developed. Okay, let's hit some other hot button issues. We'll, we won't spend the whole time on foreign policy because I want to, I want to, as in our last dialogue, I want to cover a broad area. Okay. And, and I want to do it around books, actually. So I started with the Emerson just for, for, for fun. But, um, but let's hit North Korea. I, I think I'd like to talk about North Korea, Syria a little bit, and maybe Brazil because we we're talking about it. And it's, and interestingly enough, I think because it's something that I haven't read about uh, uh, before, and so that may be my ignorance. But anyway, so what about North Korea? Well, actually, uh, uh, Trump is not my favorite person, yeah. as you know. Yeah. But on North Korea, basically, I think he's doing the right things, and he's attacked for it on all sides. Uh, whenever he does something more or less right. Why? I don't know. Maybe he's shooting arrows it's randomly monkey, and some of them hit the target, every now and then you know, they get it right. Whatever yeah. the reasons are. Yeah. But uh, let's take a look at North Korea on uh, just the recent history. Uh, April 27th, I think it was, 2017, uh, the two Koreas met and issue, uh, uh, negotiated and issued a very serious document, a historic document, Panmunjom Declaration. Mm -hmm. Very serious. Uh, it, in fact, a good article about it in Foreign Affairs of all places. Yeah. Uh, for the first time, they not only made uh, rhetorical commitments towards denuclearization, mm -hmm. towards uh, integration, sure. uh, and as Foreign Affairs pointed out, made concrete proposals here. We'll do it step by step. Mm -hmm. And then it said uh, the two Koreas will do this on their own accord. Mm -hmm. crucially, yeah. on their own accord, meaning leave mm -hmm. us alone. Uh, uh -huh. We know who they're talking to. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, Trump is the one leading figure for whatever reason who's more or less observed this. The uh, Singapore uh, summit for which Trump was bitterly denounced by mm. the liberals, uh, the con conservatives, by everyone, he basically said, well, you guys go ahead on your own accord. Uh, yeah, I he, mean. Uh, even uh, took steps towards uh, reducing what he recognized to be a provocative military uh, operations, American military operations in South Korea. Remember what's going on. And these operations, the U.S. is flying uh, nuclear-capable uh, uh, aircraft bombers right at the border of a country that the U.S. wiped out, literally wiped out yeah. back in the early 50s. I mean, by the time the war settled into a kind of a stalemate, uh, what was happening was the U.S. Just was bombing massively. Yeah. They couldn't find any more targets. Yeah. You read the official Air Force history. They describe how, well, we nothing to bomb. We'll just bomb the dams which is a huge war crime. Yeah, yeah. And then it discusses how, it's interesting to read, how euphoric they were about bombing this huge dam and a massive flood of waters uh, swamping uh, uh, all this area and Asians, uh, a little bit of racism, they yeah. depend on rice and where they're fleeing and they're screaming and so on. This is the country that we're now flying nuclear on 
bombers right on their border. So yes, it is provocative. And uh, Trump said, well, let's, let's cut back some of this. I mean, I'm not saying what he said was wonderful, but it's basically but in the surprised. right direction. Well, we, except what he says and what he does are not always exactly the same. I mean, well, that's, and, and the, you know, the one thing, it's interesting to me that after all this bluster, the foreign policy is somewhat coming back to what might have been considered more realistic. I mean, there's st- the, the, the last... The last dialogue broke off because once again the United States said, "Unless you totally disarm, we're not gonna, we're not gonna reduce actions," which is just seems to me to be completely unrealistic. Well, that's I think you know I don't know the inside story, yeah. but it looks like Pompeo and Bolton. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean it seems as if Trump's instinct was to say, "Well, go ahead," but he was kind of pushed. And remember, he's under attack from all sides. Right. Yeah. The liberals attack him even more sharply than as sharply as the hawks. But uh, as I say, of all the major political actors here, he seems on this issue, on this issue. to be the one who's closest to being what I would regard as taking a sane position, letting the two Koreas proceed on their own accord as they've asked to. And I think that that's what's going to. My own opinion, I guess, agrees that that's what if it's going to if this quote-unquote crisis is going to resolve itself, it's going to happen to some extent internally if we, if we allow it to be the case. That's it's, the way to, that's I mean, the only the, hope. North Korea Outside is going to powers cannot help. Yeah, and North Korea, I think, recognizes that a greater alliances with South Korea will will be beneficial to it, and South Korea... Well, I similarly. think President Moon is following a pretty reasonable path. Well, let, let's say, okay, since we, since you mentioned the, the T word, um, let's, let's talk, let's, we'll come back to, foreign, but let's talk about Trump, because of course, that's all anyone seems to talk about. And uh, discussions of Trump dominate all, uh, everything else. We don't hear about any other issues. And I want to, maybe we can talk about that a little bit. Well, Trump is a very effective con man. Mm -hmm. He's uh, doing, got to praise him for his achievements. Yeah. Narrow set of skills, but he's using them very effectively. He's got the major media completely uh, wrapped around his little finger. He manipulates them totally. Uh, One crazy thing after another, they talk about that. uh, Then they say it doesn't make any sense and everybody's forgotten because he's on to the next one. So one day it's uh, let's eliminate the whole health system. Mm -hmm. Uh, Everybody attacks that. uh, Two days later, he says, let's stop all traffic across the Mexican border, which, of course, would shut down the economy. Everyone points that out. And then the next day, it'll be something else. Uh, Meanwhile, he's carrying out a very effective job. You probably saw the uh, article in the New York Times a couple days ago about how uh, he's totally taken over the Republican Party from top to bottom. It's now his party. And remember, uh, two years ago, uh, the Republican establishment hated him. Yeah. Okay, now he's taken over the whole party. And he's carrying he's carrying out something pretty... First of all, this should not be much of a surprise. If you look back the last 10 or 15 years, uh, even a little beyond, uh, during the neoliberal period since basically Reagan, uh, both parties have shifted to the right. Uh, the Democrats are kind of what used to be called moderate Republicans. Uh-huh. Uh, the Republicans have just gone off the edge. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the Norman Ornstein, Thomas Mann of American Enterprise Institute uh, described them plausibly as a, a radical insurgency, which has given up parliamentary politics. Yeah, I mean, the health care plan that now is, would, in Reagan's time, would have been Reagan. The way off. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Like, if you read Eisenhower now, he sounds like Bernie Sanders almost. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we've gone so far, to, literally. Okay, so what what's happened? Even Barry the, Goldwater. The Republicans are so. I mean, both parties are yeah. essentially business parties, but the Republicans, just with abject subordination to wealth and corporate power, can't get votes that way. Mm-hmm. So they've been forced to try to mobilize constituencies, which in the past weren't really major political constituencies, and to try to get them to be the base of the party on what are called ridiculously cultural issues. So gun rights, uh, abortion, uh, religious fanaticism, um, xenophobia, whatever it may yeah. be. And, if, and this has been showing up in the primaries uh, for quite a while. 
So over the past years, in every Republican primary, when somebody comes up from the base, they're out of, you know, they're way out of the outfield. Y- y- yeah. uh, Michelle Bachman, y- uh, yeah. Rick Santorum. Y- uh, exactly. And, and the establishment has been able to crush them, get their Mitt Romney types. Uh-huh. The difference in 2016 was they couldn't crush them. Mm-hmm. Uh, this time, the crazy guy from the outfield got in. Uh-huh. Now, the base, he's got the base behind him, uh, and he's controlling them, and he's carrying out a very effective policy. How much he understands what he's doing, I have no idea. Yeah. Maybe it's just megalomania, but uh, Likely. he's got two constituencies. He's got to keep uh, supporting him. The primary constituency is the one of the Republican Party, mm-hmm. uh, the very rich, uh, the corporate sector. Uh, so, okay, we hand that task over to Mitch McConnell, uh, Paul Ryan, um, ram through the legislation, which uh, stuffs pockets with even more dollars, uh, shafts everyone else, and so on. Now, that's going beautifully. Now, the rich and the, the corporations have profits uh, zooming. They don't know what to do with them. Trillions of dollars they can't spend. The wealthy are doing magnificently. The the tax scam, the one legislative achievement, uh, we don't have to talk about it. Yeah. So that's one constituency. Meanwhile, you've got to control the voting base. How do you do that? You know, throw them a little red meat, uh, build a wall, uh, keep out the rapists and murderers, uh, uh, shift, uh, you know, love Israel, uh, shift the embassy for the evangelicals, yeah. uh, one thing after another. He's carrying it off. The base adores him while they're getting shafted. I mean, that's always been the remarkable thing is how people can but always vote against their own But it's, it's doing very well. And what are the Democrats doing? Helping him. Mm-hmm. Uh, like exactly. the focus on the Miller investigation, which was tactically crazy. Um, it was obvious from the beginning that if anything's going to come out of that, it'll be that Trump was by trying to build a hotel in the Red Square or yeah, something, some yeah. minor corruption. Yeah, I'm not saying that in retrospect. I've been saying it for a long time. Yeah, yeah. We, all right, what they've done now is probably maybe even hand Trump the 2020 election by just uh, instead of the real issues like, hey, you're destroying the en- environment for for future life. Uh, you're building up, your your nuclear posture review is greatly extending the likelihood of total catastrophe. Uh, you're pouring money into the pockets of the super rich and, uh, distru- and issuing uh, regulations and uh, executive orders and legislation which is harming the working class and everyone else. Instead of that, uh, Trump is going to sh- uh, Mueller's going to show that the Russians interfered with the election and you helped. You know the Russians couldn't. In- I mean, if the Russians interfered with the elections, it was undetectable. I mean, it's trivial. I mean, there is, after all, massive interference with the elections. <laughs> yeah, like they're bought. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you can predict the outcome of um, Tom Ferguson's work is hmm. the, the main work on this. You can you, there's this show correlation. That, uh, what he calls the investment theory of politics, with remarkable precision way back, right through 2016, you can predict electability for the executive and Congress simply with the single variable of campaign spending. And that's just the beginning. Mm -hmm. Is that interference with elections? Well, yeah. It means that uh, as very good work in the academic political science shows... uh, Most of the population is literally unrepresented. Uh, Their own representatives pay no attention to their preferences. They listen to other voices. Do you think the Supreme Court decision in that regard in terms of of money spent on elections was significantly changed it or not? It's it's changed, but it's changed something that already existed. Yeah, it certainly is. You go back to uh, 1895, uh, Mark Hanna, who was the famous campaign manager, was asked once... uh, what does it take to run, a, run an effective campaign? He said, there are two things. Uh, the first thing is money. And I've forgotten what the second one is. That was 1895. <laughs> of course, uh, you know, uh, the 
recent decisions, Buckley Valley and yeah. Citizens United, have enhanced that enormously, but it goes way back. Well, the other thing that, so we're talking about history and statements, and I forget whether it was Goering or Goebbels who said that if you want to, if you want to get people to do what you want them to do, it doesn't matter whether you have a dem- democracy or dictatorship, just make them afraid. And and that seems to also, in some sense, being an being effect. I mean, this whole notion of immigrants being being the greatest danger facing the United States, the opposite of most of American history, in fact, uh, is, is I'm, I'm finding it kind of amazing to see it, how effective it works. It works. Yeah. I mean, and again, there's a long history. Uh, Hofstadter talked about anti-intellectualism. But yeah. Another kind of striking feature of American culture from way back is that uh, although this is the most secure country in the world by any objective standard, lucky to have oceans around it. Probably the most frightened. Yeah. It's a very frightened country. Uh, That lies behind, partly, there's a lot more, but it's one of the things that lies behind this kind of crazed gun culture. Why do you have to have uh, 25 assault rifles in your closet? They're coming after me. You know, I got to protect myself. Yeah, and it, it comes, and again, it's an issue that I hope we're going to cut get when we come back in some sense. That, uh, but, you know, th- this recent book by John Haid and others about the coddling of the American mind have argued that that level of being frightened it, it affects people's behavior on a, on a micro scale as well. The notion that every time your kids leave the house, they're in danger and they should never be in danger and never be in risk somehow comes into the notion that they should never be uncomfortable. They shouldn't be uncomfortable in school. They shouldn't hear ideas. They don't want to... Everything is a threat. And it is true, I think, that... I remember when, when I, I spent a year in, in, uh, in Switzerland when, when, uh, at, the, at CERN when my daughter was younger. She was, my daughter was, I remember, at eight or nine or ten, and she was really afraid of going outside the house on her own in living where we lived at the time. And it was remarkable to see when she was in Switzerland that, you know, I, I would drive my car and I'd suddenly see her and her friends downtown. And, and so this notion of every time you leave the house, the world is terrifying really does seem to be an American kind and of... And it's, it's recent. I mean, when I was a kid in the 30s and early 40s, when I was, I lived in Philadelphia, yeah. when I was uh, maybe 12 years old, I used to take the train by myself to New York and spend the day walking around uh, Anarchist bookstores. And my parents didn't know <laughs> what I was, was doing. That was the problem. That was there. You see, if they just control but my, you. <laughs> but it was not considered <laughs> yeah. anything like that. When, I, I grew up in Canada, but it was still the same for me. In Toronto, I used to take the, 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 the subway car down to see like baseball games. When I, we moved into the suburbs when my kids were little. Uh-huh. And uh, this place, we, I mean, you can't imagine a place that's more safe. Mm. Uh, kids were playing in the streets. They'd go into each other's mm-hmm. houses and so on. You go to the same neighborhood now, you don't see a child. Uh, either they're inside looking at video games or they're being driven somewhere for organized activities. Yeah. Uh, kids, it's been, in fact, studied. Children don't know how to play uh, spontaneously. Everything has to be controlled. They have to be watched all the time. Uh, and if if they're, you know, somewhere maybe in, uh, you know, uh, Oregon, uh, a kid got uh, kidnapped, uh, everything in the country has to close down. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the dangers back in the 30s and 40s were far greater, but it just wasn't an issue. Yeah, no, it's very interesting. But this uh, business of the Trump knows what he's doing when he builds up uh, fear of the rapists and murderers and Islamic terrorists. And just to give you an example, a couple of weeks ago, uh, uh, Steve Bannon, you know, is yes. kind of um, Rasputin, uh, uh, <laughs> came down to... to uh, uh, Arizona, where we live, yeah. in Tucson, and there was a meeting. He ran a meeting at a very luxurious gated community south of Tucson, not too far from the border. You know, guards, gates, yeah, sure. uh, very rich, and so on. Uh, the perp, he had a lot of nice people there, like Chris Kobach, this guy who's trying to keep people from voting. And yeah. so on. Uh, there was a good report of it in a kind of a independent Tucson newspaper, Tucson Sentinel, had a reporter there. Uh, the goal of the meeting was to try to raise private money to build the wall. Mm-hmm. Of course, Congress is run by communists. Mm-hmm. You know, they're not going to do anything. Uh, so all these super rich people are pitching in money to yeah. build the wall. But the discussions were interesting. Uh, people were describing how f- frightened they are. I mean, if there's anybody in the world safer than them, 
I don't know how you'd find them. Yeah, yeah. But these are people who are frightened. We got to protect ourselves. In fact, there was one legislator there who said, I'm not only in favor of the wall, I think we ought to have a wall from the border right along the Arizona border uh, against California (laughs) all the way up to the Canadian border because these people are going to come in from California. You know, we've got to protect ourselves. And not only do we, maybe we need an army to protect us around the gated community. but yeah, and, no, this, and when Trump talks to the public, at least according to the reports that come up, people resonate. Yeah, no, it's, it, it really works effectively. I, I never know with Trump whether it's an accident or whether he's plan, you know, whether he really knows what he's doing, whether he just latches on by luck to an issue that, that seems to resonate and he, and and he, and he uses it, up. it yeah. and then pick it up. He just tests the water. But he's with, doing that very... But meanwhile, you have to remember that his primary constituency, corporate power yeah. and the wealthy, uh, he's serving them with uh, uh, real uh, dedication. Would, would, did you, would you say that in terms of, you know, I mean, I don't want to harp on this too much, but in, in terms of the greatest danger, if there is one, of, of, of Trump being president, may, many people feel that the fact that he's loose cannon, the fact that he does no, 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 no reading, no knowledge about details about the world around him, or certainly doesn't read or listen to his advisors, would you say that's a bigger danger than the fact that effectively he's apparently um, implementing underneath all the noise uh, the the uh, an agenda that 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 you worry about or not? I mean, uh, there's a lot of dangers with Trump. Uh, the worst one, which overwhelms everything else, is the dedication to destroy the environment. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, that just swamps everything else. That ought to be a screaming headline every day. Well, I'm surprised that if 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 private money wanted to build the wall, eight point six billion is not a lot of money for. That could easily be done. I mean, more than that spent on elections. Uh, but, but interestingly enough, when you put it in perspective, talking about the environment, talking about about progress, eight point six billion, which is what he's asking for the wall, was more is more than the entire amount, the entire budget of the National Science Foundation. I mean, if one talks about what is better for our security in the future, how, it, how about the uh, subsidies to the fossil fuel industry? Which much bigger than that? How yeah. about the subsidies to the financial institutions. Uh, There's some good technical studies, IMF and Mm. others, who point out that the financial institutions, which are pretty much predatory, they don't, they barely help the economy, they may harm it. And they're a huge part of the economy. They're huge. They are maintained effectively by public subsidy, by the implicit government insurance policy. Mm-hmm. which raises their credit ratings, gives them access to cheap money. Uh, when you count all of that, it's pretty much their profits. I mean, compared with this, uh, the wall and the National Science Foundation aren't even visible. Yeah, yeah. No, that's, I mean, it's interesting to think about that. I mean, and similarly, when we come to the climate change and... and, and well, that's, those issues, the, that's the, the two things that ought to be emphasized by the political opposition, if there were one, mm-hmm. are this dedicated commitment to destroy the prospects for organized human life within a short period and the radical uh, intensification of the already extremely dangerous uh, uh, arms con- military yeah, confrontation. I, I, I was going to hit that. that. Those, I think, I know that from our discussions, those are the two but, biggest but challenges. I think there's another danger uh-huh. that we shouldn't forget. I was personally very relieved when the Miller investigation didn't come up with much, because it, if they had come up with something that really implicates Trump, uh-huh. we would have been in deep trouble. I mean, he's a narcissistic megalomaniac. He's kind of like the magician behind the curtain in The Wizard of Oz. Uh-huh. He knows that it's a very thin cover. Mm-hmm. If anything breaks, he could go for broke. Uh, there's plenty that he could do. Yeah, but I know people are worried about what you know, what, and I don't know who said it. In fact, that that that, uh, well, maybe it was James Comey, not someone who's I agree with all the time, but that that he was worried that that exactly that would happen and it would lead to some kind of and it, there'd be violence that would. That well, would, he's he's already indicated his dog whistling is worth listening to, so uh, take his uh, attacks on John McCain, mm-hmm. which people are wondering why why is he attacking John McCain. Uh, 
Well, there's a very good article on this by uh, Bruce Franklin, very good analyst, who's also the leading specialist on the uh, POW mythology. You know, there's a lot of the country still believes that uh, the North Koreans, uh, the North Vietnamese are holding all sorts of American POWs mm. and a terrible thing. And McCain is one of their villains uh, because he's uh, part of the myth is that he's the one who sold people out yeah. and helped yeah. keep our brave American boys there. Uh, Rambo has to go in and rescue them and so on. That's a pretty big thing in a sector of the country, a sector of the country that Crump openly talks to. When he talks about how his uh, bikers are tough guys and they're going to really cause trouble, that's who he's talking to. When he attacks McCain, he's talking to them. He's throwing them the red meat. Uh, this is clever politics and very dangerous. This is a very violent country. Um, there are militias all over, probably better armed than the National Guard, you know, a lot of desperate, angry people. Uh, people have been hit by the stagnation of the neoliberal period. There's economic distress. Uh, there's concern that uh, uh, somehow the white, that the white population is, as they put it, facing genocide, meaning we might not be a majority in a couple of decades. Uh, mm -hmm. All of this is very real. And when these uh, dog whistling uh, attacks on McCain and the uh, you know the the hints about uh, uh, the Mexican rapists overcoming mm. us and destroying us, all of that's talking to a sector of the population that's very real, is under a kind of distress, stemming largely back from economic policies that right at the top that are creating the kinds of a situation which we now are, there's something similar in Europe, uh, all, of, all of this converges. And when you get this, again, narcissistic megalomaniac who's a clever politician sitting right at the top of it and pulling the strings, it's, it's a fragile system, but it's working and very dangerous. Okay, well, so, since we're on an uplifting area, and let me try and <laughs> think of um, any buttons we haven't pushed yet before we move on. And I think it's we, we probably should push this button at least once. So, so let's talk about Syria and Israel for a little bit and see if we can alienate the part of the public that we haven't so far. Um, <laughs> uh, so Syria, Israel? Well, and Syria is a total disaster. The mm. country's yeah. been virtually destroyed. We can mm. look at the history. But uh, uh, here again, uh, I'm afraid I disagree with my, many of my friends on the left on this. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the Trump proposals uh, was uh, to leave a small contingent of troops in uh, a sector of northern Syria, which is mostly Kurdish. The Kurdish, yeah, yeah. I think that's a good idea. Mm -hmm. a, a, you know, anti-interventionists just uh, block out on this. We've got to take them out. They have mm -hmm. no right to be there and so on. But think it through for a second. Uh, the Turkish uh, army uh, uh, is military is carrying out, again, it's done worse before, uh, serious atrocities against Kurds in Turkey itself and in the areas of Syria that they have occupied recently, Afrin. If they move on to uh, Rojava, the other mostly Kurdish areas, that'll just continue. What's stopping them? Small contingent of U.S. troops, which are confined to the Syrian areas and are not intervening elsewhere in Syrian affairs. I don't like U.S. troops to be anywhere. Mm -hmm. But in this case, I think it's not out of humanitarian goals, whatever the goals may be. It may be helping to avert a serious catastrophe. I think those are things that are worth thinking about, not just kind of an axiom that yeah. says, get them out, get the troops home, period. Mm -hmm. You have to think about what the meaning is. It's not like a justification for humanitarian intervention, which is always a fraud. Yeah. This is a matter of assessing the actual situation that exists. Independent uh, of intentions, whether it has a good total impact. Total nothing to do with intentions. You know, yeah. yeah. It's uh, those we can put aside. Uh, the, the intentions we know, I mean, up until under Obama, until uh, about 2015— 
the U.S. and its allies, incidentally, France, uh, England, were mm -hmm. uh, believed that it would be possible to overthrow the Assad regime and were committed to doing so. Uh, finally, uh, I think it was around 2013, 2014, the U.S., uh, the CIA sent uh, advanced anti-tank missiles to the opposition, which by then is mostly jihadi run, mm -hmm. uh, which did stop the Syrian army advance. Uh, predictably, the Russians intervened with more mm -hmm. force, mm -hmm. started sending the Air Force, took out the tow missiles, the mm -hmm. army went on. At that point, pretty much the West accepted the fact that, like it or not, this monster, and he is a monster, mm -hmm. uh, will probably uh, control most of the country. And since then, uh, whatever uh, planning or negotiations are taking place are mostly out of the West's hands. It's uh, Russia, Iran, uh, Syria are pretty mm -hmm. much running the show, mm -hmm. like it or not. And there's not a lot that no U.S. can do about that, the, uh, even if it should. But... Uh, yeah. With regard to, to Israel, it's, it's, there's a lot to say about this, but the uh, the support, what's called the support for Israel here, is very reminiscent of old-fashioned Stalinism. Mm -hmm. It's extraordinary when you look into it, uh, up to the level of books published by university presses, which are just full of outlandish lies and fabrications at denouncing anybody, me, of course, yeah. who dares to raise a minor criticism about the holy state. Uh, the level of lying uh, is spectacular. Uh, could go into examples, but it's not well, worth it. Well, let me, well, okay, go on. But so I was It's gonna, not even uh, worth yeah. talking about that. Mm. But, but the, uh, there's a kind of a desperate effort now on the part of those who supported the will call themselves supporters of Israel. I don't think that's the right term. I think they're supporters of Israel's uh, moral degeneration and maybe ultimate destruction, but that's another story. Mm. Who call themselves supporters of Israel since the 1970s have increasingly been finding their backs to the wall because public opinion is changing mm -hmm. uh, strikingly, especially among younger people. Uh, polls are very clear. Even uh, uh, personal experience is very clear. So like up till uh, maybe 10 years ago, if I gave a talk about Israel-Palestine at a university, even mm -hmm. my own university, mm -hmm. I had to have police protection. The police had to follow me out to my car because meetings were broken up and nobody was worrying about uh, free speech at universities. Yeah, well, we'll get to that. Yeah, you know, those, and this that's is an changed. issue that's, that's changed. That's changed. In fact, among uh, people who identify themselves as liberal Democrats, uh, actually support for Palestinian rights is even higher than Israel at this point. Support for Israel has gone to the most reactionary parts of the population, uh, evangelical Christians, uh, xenophobes, uh, the Democratic Party used to be the base for as support for Israel. It still is, but nothing like the Republicans. They're extreme. Trump, of course, is. But what I mean, but at the same time, when with a recent discussion about you know the Golan Heights, I, I read it and I heard that there was some concern, but then I didn't see any big out, outcry. Well, it's pretty interesting. I um, mean, in the uh, the Golan Heights have been recognized internationally, including the United States, as occupied territory. Uh -huh. uh, the U.S signed, supported the Security Council resolution, resolutions uh, declaring that uh, Israeli uh, efforts to take over the heights, and in particular their annexation of the heights, which they did, is absolutely illegal, has no basis in international yeah, law, can't yeah. be accepted. That was true up until Trump. A couple of weeks ago, he just reversed it. Okay, now they're allowed to take it over. Anybody talking about it? No, that's why I was amazed. I mean, men, people mention it, and then I, I, I mean, never really saw much of an outcry about it after. You say, well, maybe it's not tactically good. It might alienate somebody. Um, then the idea is, well, Israel needs this for its defense. This is outlandish. I mean, the Israeli military overwhelms everyone in the area combined, you know, mm -hmm. quite apart from the fact that they have a big nuclear arsenal. But they're the military force in the region, Yeah, one of the major... Uh, the Golan Heights, it's not defense. They want it because it's nice territory. Uh, you have, uh, it's economic, it's a, it's a very nice area. You have the ski, ski lope, 
the skis on the Mount Hermon, uh, uh, build agricultural communities, a nice place to visit and live. They want it, okay? There's, there's no military threat there. When well, pe- people always say, I suppose it's a buffer, I mean, right? when people say uh, Hezbollah is at their border, yeah. uh, can, can, Hezbollah is not an insignificant military force. But the only respect in which they're a threat to Israel, the only respect, is if Israel attacks Lebanon, they'll fight back. Mm -hmm. And that is a threat to Israel. So, in fact, if Israel were to proceed with its occasionally announced plans to attack Iran, probably the first thing they'd do is wipe out Lebanon just to prevent the deterrence of Hezbollah missiles. So, yes, that's a threat, if you like. We might ask the same question about what the Iranian threat is supposed to be. Uh, who is Iran threatening? Um, suppose Iran had nuclear weapons. I mean, where's the threat? Mm-hmm. I mean, if they dared to arm a missile with nuclear weapons, the country would be wiped out. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's, 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 uh, in fact, U.S. intelligence is pretty clear about this. If you look at their presentations to Congress over many years, they've pointed out that... Uh, basic picture is that Iran has very low military expenditures by the standards of the region, let alone the United yeah. States. But uh, its, uh, def- its strategic posture is defensive, trying to set up to ensure that it can react to aggression sufficiently so diplomacy will take over. Uh, they say if it were to develop nuclear weapons, they would be part of its deterrent strategy. Well, I've always, I mean, as someone who's always been concerned about missile defense, which is which is an oxymoron in some way, in so many ways we could go into, it doesn't work, first of all. But but uh, but that, coming back to what you said, in Europe, I've always been amazed that the people say that we're defending Europe from Iranian missile. What what possible purpose would Iran have to to launch missiles at Europe? Yeah, right? yeah. If they only want, had a suicidal impulse. Yeah, yeah. I just, of course, it, the country would be wiped out. But I've never seen that question. It's, it's, no, it, and that's oh, that's the liberals, remember. That's yeah. Obama. Yeah, no. He was the one who was putting the missile installations on the... Okay, well, we've gone on into foreign affairs and Trump more than I might have, but I think it was important in this context. But let, but let me take it back because you, you raised something interesting that you can now you're finding you're able to give talks without police protection on certain issues at the same time um i actually had a quote from one of your books which i think i used in our last dialogue but uh but for, which was originally i think a quote that was set up from catholic priests in south america talking about the educational system and they said educational systems are oriented to maintaining the existing social and economic structures instead of transforming them and this notion that, that we started with, the notion that um, intellectuals and elites aren't necessarily, uh, are, are sort of by the party line almost more than any, anyone else. But I see uh, another issue that's really become more pronounced since we last had our dialogue, which is this issue of free speech. And in this case, free speech on campuses. You may be able to speak more freely, but one is finding more and more two things that are are remarkable interesting and maybe to some extent disturbing. That is, first of all, that that we're seeing uh, more and more speakers, uh, especially on the right to some extent, but but almost every subject area being um, uh, stopped from speaking on campus, not but I mean, by students in this case. The, the notion that there was there was a there was a um, a lecture that was happening in a, in a university in the West where the speaker was com- going to speak about due process and free speech. And there were and safe rooms were set up on campus so that students didn't have to hear discussions about this. Yet it's an issue that seems to now be adopted by the right. That 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 there, if you look at and saying who is speaking out, and again, one of the you know Trump's executive order may be impotent, but the notion that Trump would would put an executive order saying universities can't get federal funding unless they promote free speech is is kind of interesting. This notion that that the left in some ways is is now being seen as not promoting free speech. So I thought I, we, we should have that discussion a little bit. Well, I'd question the notion of the left, but it's certainly happening. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's wrong in principle. And beyond that, it's just tactically insane. It's the best gift that you can give to the right. Yeah. If some uh, right-wing speaker tries to go to a campus and is blocked, it's a gift. Uh, it's they love it, and you can see the way they're using it. 
that says, oh, okay, we're the, we're the good guys. Yeah. We're defending freedom of speech. You guys are Nazis trying to protect. So if you want, if you want to give uh, enormous gifts to the right wing and the, uh, uh, to the far right, uh, to the neo-fascists, that's the way to do it. But it exactly. But it's even broader than that, I think, that there's some concern. And you know, two people that I, I obviously am not a fan of Trump, I'm not a fan of Betsy DeVos. I've written about how... Uh, opposed many of our aspects but she but but there's another aspect of this notion which comes back to people being afraid in the united states this oh. notion that words have to be protected that, that words are scary that there needs to be safe zones it's I've, like I've, I've, uh, that, trigger warnings trigger yeah. warnings so. that when you when you would think and i've always said this in the context of science but i think it's true more generally one of the purposes of education i used to say it of science but one of the purposes of education is to make people uncomfortable because if you're comfortable, you're not pushing the you're 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 not pushing the boundaries of what you know, understand, and if we if we I was just at a, a lecture where 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 people were saying they they've changed their curriculum for, because they're if they upset students they're worried that universities will remove them from teaching, um, and and that that seems to me especially in an environment where our at least our higher educational system has been very effective. Uh, in, in educating students more more so maybe than the public school system, I, I'm as concerned about. I you, I think you're you're the fact that the right is usurping an issue that will come back to haunt others is one thing, but I'm more I'm equally concerned about the fact that people are afraid of ideas or or discussions that make them uncomfortable. That's first of all, that's always been true, but since it was always the mainstream who was fighting off the wild men in the wings. Yeah. Nobody noticed it. Uh, now we're noticing it. Uh, and it, it was wrong then, and it's wrong now. It's even worse now with the idea that somehow, like what you said, you have to have special places where students won't hear things. Mm. Uh, this is totally crazy. I mean, if a speaker comes in who you think is uh, extremely offensive, uh, first of all, you don't have to go to the talk if you don't want. Exactly. But the sane thing to do, which sometimes is done, is to use it, use the opportunity as an educational opportunity. Yeah. Go listen to them. Meanwhile, set up alternative forums where you discuss the issues, you think about them, you look at the pros and cons. Nothing is ever 100% obvious. Yeah. Uh, let's, let's go through it. Let's come out with a reasonable position. We'll have a basis if it's the right out outcome to oppose their positions, not just shout them down saying, well, we're so scared of them, we can't even hear and, them. And exactly. Shout them down, play music so they can't talk, even if they're allowed on campus. It's, it's, I, I've, uh, I've had enough of that in my own experience, but that's not the reason. It's wrong whoever does it. When uh, the right wing is targeted, it's uh, tactically crazy. When the left is targeted, it doesn't matter because nobody pays attention yeah, anyway. Yeah. But uh, when those who have some basis in power systems are attacked, then it's tactically ridiculous because it's giving them an enormous gift. Well, what I what I never see is this recognition, well, I very rarely see it, of the fact that the whole purpose of free speech is to protect the speech of those you detest. In principle. That's, that's what a democracy is supposed to in be. In principle. But mm -hmm. the people who have upheld that have always been bitterly denounced. On every issue. Well, and but you know what's? I but, can give you many examples. Yeah, but I'm pretty scared. I mean, as someone who sort of grew up in the '60s, to see that w the people that I used to think of as progressive That's are now supporting exactly the opposite. Yes, but that was the '60s. Yeah. And remember, the '60s was the period when even the Supreme Court, really for the first time, took strong positions in support of freedom of speech. That's not American history. It's worth remembering that. First of all, the First Amendment does not protect freedom of speech. It, prote it prevents prior restraint. Yeah. But if uh, I give a talk uh, criticizing the government, First Amendment permits them to put me into jail as long as they didn't stop me from saying it in the first place. First Amendment's a very weak barrier to repression. And in fact, uh, freedom of speech issues didn't arise at the court level, the Supreme Court, until the 20th century. And if you look at the history, it's not uplifting. Mm -hmm. The first protections of freedom of speech, sort of, were during the First World War, 
the famous uh, descents of Holmes and Brandes. Yes. Notice, first of all, they were descents. Uh, secondly, they were quite very limited. So in the Schenck case, the first case where Schenck, uh, this guy was being sent, you know, sentenced for having written pamphlets against the war, uh, the dissenters, Holmes, voted in favor of the uh, uh, of of the decision. They said, "Well, you know, too far. We've got to got to have a little freedom of speech." Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, did it. Uh, it's a very mixed record up until the '60s. The first strong defense of freedom of speech by the court was actually in 1964. That's Times v. Sullivan, mm -hmm. when it was a civil rights issue, when yeah. uh, um, the state of Alabama uh, uh, declared that they were being libeled by the Martin Luther King and the civil rights movement because you know racist sheriffs were being attacked. Mm -hmm. Kind of technically they were right by the thinking of the framers, but yeah. the... Supreme Court overruled what's called sovereign immunity, yeah. that the state is protected from uh, harmful speech, which holds in most countries, incidentally, including Canada, mm -hmm. uh, including Britain. They still have that. Yeah. But, but the United States struck it down. Then there was even a further, further decisions. Uh, Bradenburg v. Ohio took a very strong position in favor of freedom of speech. That's 1969. <laughs> it's not American history. Yeah. So, yes, there is a modern tradition of protection of freedom of speech, but it's, it's not deeply rooted or sturdy. Uh, and when, say, Clarence Thomas recently uh, said, we got to review these decisions because that's not what the framers had in mind, he's not wrong, you know, if, if you really look back at the history. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, it's true that among the countries of the world, the United States is probably supreme and protection of freedom of speech. Yeah, I know. That's when I grew up in Canada, and I, I used to do history of Canada. Yeah, it's amazing to see how yeah. those protections were more well, effective here than the in Canada. Well, remember the Salman Rushdie case? Uh -huh. When uh, this came up in Canada, uh, there was a question debated about whether he was attacking the state religion. Uh -huh. And uh, they finally decided he wasn't, so it was okay because it was some other religion. Yeah. In fact, in Britain... That same case, the, remember, this was when he was criticizing Islam. Yeah, sure. It went to the House of Lords, and they considered, uh, they said, well, he isn't liable because he was condemning Islam. If he'd been condemning the Anglican Church, yeah. it would have been a different story. That's Britain. We're not talking about Nazi Germany. Yeah, yeah, no. It's, so uh, these are very thin reads. And uh, like in, in France, for example, uh, there are laws. Uh, I mean, I'm bitterly condemned for having criticized them, but there are laws in France that grant the state the right to determine historical truth and to punish deviation from what they determine. Mm -hmm. And that's been used, okay? And the French left intellectuals support it. You know, uh, we got to stop the speech we don't like. Yeah. You know? I mean, this stuff is very thin. And the United States, by and large, has comparatively a good record. But the things you're pointing out are hitting away at some of the best things that have happened here. And unfortunately, it is coming from students, young people who just aren't thinking through what they're doing. Not thinking through and have been brought up to, and I think, to, to, to fear anything that, that... That is that, a little bit uncomfortable. It makes them a little bit uncomfortable. But again, in the sciences, I mean... The whole history of the sciences is people challenging common that's, sense. That's what exactly, that's what science is all about. If, if it yeah. wasn't, you yeah. know, if we weren't uncomfortable, we're not making progress. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah, so I think, okay, good. I'm glad we got that at least, yeah. because I, I'm critically concerned about it. It's, well, and anyone it's right. who's being at universities, I think, is seeing it in a but, way I've never but witnessed. But remember, it goes on all sides. Like, yeah. I, I teach at the University of Arizona, okay, yeah. right now. Uh, the There's a legislation at the state level requiring that at the University of Arizona, if a, a department invites a speaker if a, or if a faculty member invites somebody to come to, to their t t class, they have to inform the legislature. Yeah, yeah. So if, if I invite somebody to talk on um, theoretical linguistics, I got to 
and form the legislature, make sure there's no communist infiltrators there. Yeah, no, it's, uh, yes, was it when I, I found something similar when I moved to Arizona? But, okay, let's see. I, I want to, we, we uh, I want to come back to another book. I, I, I was, the two books I wanted to mention that, in fact, were books that you got me to look at. One was Daniel Ellsberg, which I think I'll come back to after. The other one was uh, this book by Catherine Nixie, The Dark, Darkening Age. It's an amazing uh, book. It's an amazing book that shows basically how Christianity effectively, in a way that makes ISIS look tame, right. um, destroyed the classical world. And, and, um, and I, I bring it up because we've had this discussion before, and, I, and I, I'm known for my concerns about religion in many ways. Uh, and I remember you saying to me that one of the first times we talked that you didn't, it wasn't what people believed that, that bothered you, it was what they did. And I, and I countered by saying that's true, but I think what they, what they believe radically affects what they do. And when I, when I, and, and I, I was thinking about that book recently with another article about Mike Pompeo and his, how his evangelical Christianity has affected his role as, as a secretary of state and exactly how he approaches not just the Middle East, everywhere else. And so I continue to think that there's this insidious impact of of religion, in this case, Christian religion, but it happens obviously in the Islamic world. Uh, 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 and so I wanted to talk to you about it in this, you know. Well, it's a mixed story. I mean, you know, it's a complicated story. Yeah, we of course. can't get a couple thousand years of history yeah, in a yeah, minute. Absolutely. But yeah. if you think about it in a broad, we have more than a minute. superficial <laughs> yeah. rant, a uh-huh. picture, Christianity in the early days was radical pacifist, mm-hmm. and uh, Christians were persecuted. As Nixie points mm-hmm. out, yeah. a lot of it was purposeful martyrdom. Un- yeah, but, uh, Because the mm-hmm. classical period was fairly tolerant. Yeah, unbelievable. It was tolerant. polytheistic, yeah. so, yeah. you know, you believe in that God, I believe in this God, we'll just but add let's get God, together it doesn't and matter, go ahead. You know. and, uh, uh, but nevertheless, there was persecution. Sure. When Constantine turn Christianity into the religion of the Roman Empire, Mm -hmm. and the cross shifted from being a symbol of persecution to being on the shield of the Roman Mm -hmm. legionnaires, everything changed. Uh, First of all, the radical Christians, it went on a rampage. Mm -hmm. As you say, it makes ISIS look pretty tame. They virtually destroyed the rich, complex, uh, pretty tolerant uh, classical uh, a culture, uh, statues, paintings, literature, philosophy, everything had to go. And they instituted a dark ages of totalitarianism, literal, for, yeah. for a millennium. It's yeah. not small, you know. Yeah. There was a totalitarian God who not only controlled you, but looked into your mind. You had to do what he said. <laughs> yeah. and it's, I don't want to over-exaggerate. Yeah. There well, were exceptions, well, but it was a real kind of totalitarian era for a millennium. Uh, and it's a God who, who would not only punishes you while you're on earth, but for eternity. <laughs> yeah, it had, I forget Augustine's, St. Augustine's phrase, something like uh, merciful terror or something like yeah, that. Because okay. we have to have terror to destroy all of this, but it's merciful because it's saving souls, you know. Well, and, um, and, and when I looked at, well, I interrupt for a second, when I looked, because I want to hear the, the completion, but in that context, after I read that book, I looked around me because you see how effectively in a few hundred years they can completely remake the world. It was a world where there was, you know, philosophy and, and it, I mean, religion was, it was you know, amazing. It, and, and then where, where every place became dominated by a church. It took a century. And, but we still live in that world in a sense. It, when, every town I go, I think of how effectively amazing they were. Yeah. Everywhere you go, you don't mind that cities are just full of churches. And, 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 and yeah. it, they did it very effectively. Okay, but let's go on. Mm-hmm. This went on pretty much until, you know, variations, but pretty much until 1962 mm-hmm. when uh, Pope John XXIII uh, called the Second Vatican Council, mm-hmm. which was a very important event in modern history, very important. Uh, the Second Vatican Council under Pope John uh, tried, among other things, to reinstitute the Gospels. Horrible thing. The Gospels have a radical pacifist message. Mm -hmm. He said, let's, uh, the uh, theme is what was called the preferential option for the poor. Uh, This was picked up by Latin American bishops who supported it. Yeah. And uh, pretty soon uh, priests, uh, nuns, uh, lay people were going out into the 
poorer areas, countryside, uh, starting to organize what were called base communities in which often illiterate uh, peasants would start thinking about the gospels, listening to what they're saying, uh, starting to get to see if they could take some control of their own lives, not just the uh, Latin American particular poverty and uh, inequality is extraordinary and uh, repression is extraordinary. But, but I know you. I know you. You're a big fan of Latin American of of the of the Liberation progressive theology. aspect of Latin American theology. But at the same time, the Gospels do sort of say, you know, the you know, it's okay to be poor because in a, in the afterlife you'll be you'll be fine. It so accept the, accept but the state. Uh, don't talk about. Yes, don't but confront what, the state. What these activists were doing was saying you can take care of your lives. Mm-hmm. We can listen to the rat, the preferential option for the poor, but do something about it. Okay. That was the important part. And it was important. Mm-hmm. The United States went to war against the church yeah. starting then. Yeah, and and a lot of the recent history of Latin America reflects that, uh, maybe by coincidence. But in 1962, uh, Kennedy uh, shifted the mission of the Latin American military from uh, hemispheric defense, it's kind of an anachronistic holdover from the Second World War, yeah, yeah. to internal security. That has a meaning. It means war against the population. He sent a military mission to Colombia, where the worst atrocities were going on then, uh, led by a Greenbury general, which came back with a report. It, it uh, recommended paramilitary terror, that's the phrase, against known communist adherents, which is a very broad category yeah. in the Latin American context. Uh, the, uh, uh, the director of uh, counter, counterinsurgency for Kennedy and Johnson, Charles Machling, had a very strong critique of this. He said that this turned uh, tolerance of the rapacity of the Latin American military into support uh, for activities uh, that are reminiscent of the stormtroopers of Hitler. You had government after government falling under uh, Mm -hmm. uh, neo-fascist, neo-Nazi military regimes, uh, brutal murder, plague spread all over the hemisphere, all the way to Central America under Reagan. Lots of religious martyrs, including the Archbishop in El Salvador, finally, Mm -hmm. 1989, uh, the murder of six leading Latin American intellectuals at the university in El Salvador, Jesuit priests. Uh, And finally, finally, what you have is the School of the Americas, which trains Latin American officers, has what are called talking points. We advertise our achievements. One of them is the U.S. Army helped defeat liberation theology. That's a substantial part of the history. So it's a, like a lot of things. The story is complicated. And it's interesting that one that the Latin American priest who became a, a pope was was in fact not, as far as I can see, not a liberation <laughs> theology. But in fact, as far if you, I think if you look at his his history in in Latin well, America, was the opposite. This is part of the. It's a very striking part of the history. Mm. The point was when there was an effort to go back to the message of the Gospels and to interpret it mm. as meaning do something about your own lives. The hammer came, came down right. very hard. Well, but now the hammer is somewhere else. And I, I, I'm, I'm wonder if you're as concerned. I am, I think both of us in different ways have been attacked. I certainly, when I've stated this, but, and you know, recently you, one hears that one is, there's much more, it's certainly in, in domestic terms, in the United States, in other words, more concern among Police organizations about about right wing terrorism than than Islamic terrorism, and, oh, it's and far worse. It's far worse. Take and, a look at the FBI records. Exactly, so and and but here we see this incredible connection between evangelical Christianity, not just in Mike Pompeo and in our foreign affairs, but in in but the White House in a way that has never been. I mean, it may have been implicit, but now it's incredibly overt. Well, it's it's more than that. It's planned. Yeah. So. Uh, it goes back to what we were talking about before about the parties going to the right and the Republicans going off into outer space. <laughs> they had to organize new constituencies. Uh, this starts with Nixon and the Southern strategy. Uh, since uh, uh, Democrats were associated with civil rights, Nixon and his 
associates figured, okay, we can pick up the uh, Southern uh, Democrats, uh, the Southern working class uh, on racist grounds. Then comes the recognition that they can pick up Northern Catholics, Catholic workers Mm -hmm. who voted Democratic by pretending to be opposed to abortion. I stress pretending. Mm -hmm. You go back to the 60s, Republican leadership is what we call Mm -hmm. pro-choice. Reagan, uh, George H.W. Bush, who was supposed to have some principles, Mm -hmm. uh, the whole stream of them were thought, yeah, this is none of the government's business, it's a woman's right. Uh, uh, The uh, Paul Paul Weirich, you know, the Republican strategist in the mid-70s, figured out that if the Republicans pretend to be anti-abortion, they can pick up the evangelical and the Catholic vote. Pretend. Uh, By now, uh, if you're a Republican uh, in Congress or uh, president, you got to be passionately uh, anti-abortion in principle. Total cynicism, but it worked. They picked up a large part of the Mm-hmm. Catholic Northern working class vote, the evangelical vote. Uh, the evangelicals are now the primary base of uh, uh, Trump's uh, mm-hmm. electoral voting coalition. And this is connected very closely to the Israel again. Uh, the evangelicals have a very interesting position on Jews and on Israel. Uh, they're the most extreme anti-Semites in human history. Uh, their p- theology, if you look at it, is that... Uh, it's not 100% of evangelicals, yeah. but a leading part of it. Uh, there's got we got to look for Armageddon. Yeah. You know, the, the, uh, then yeah. the second coming, the, Christ yeah. comes. What happens when Christ comes back? Those who are saved go to heaven. Mm-hmm. Everybody else goes to eternal perdition. Mm-hmm. What happens to the Jews? Yeah. Actually, a hundred and, according to one of the denominations, uh, 160,000 can convert in time. Mm-hmm. The rest go to eternal perdition. Yeah. Did Hitler call for that? <laughs> no, I, that, uh, I know, mean, this is the Christopher most Hitchens extreme, about that. <laughs> but this is part of the support for Israel. We have to support Israel because that's going to lead to the battle at Armageddon between yeah. Israel and whoever the next enemy is uh, shifts from time to mm-hmm. time. And uh, after that will come this wonderful thing. In fact, the Israeli government has a very interesting policy towards these guys. It kind of welcomes them because it wants the support. You know, they want the embassy in Jerusalem and so on, but it's afraid of them because these are crazed lunatics who go up to try to blow up uh, the Temple Mount. They got to stop them before they do it, you know, Uh, because they are super anti-Semites and way beyond, like there's an article in the Times today about anti-Semitism on the right and the left. Yeah, yeah, What they call anti-Semitism on the left is, say, Jeremy Corbyn being critical of policies of Israel. That's anti-Semitism on the left, the right, of course, uh, neo-Nazism, Holocaust denial, and so on. Shooting, blowing up synagogues, that's the right. But they don't talk about this, which is the most extreme anti-Semitism in in human history. There's nothing like it, you know. I mean, just think it through for a second. Well, that's what I mean by beliefs influence actions. And that's why, that's, I guess, ultimately why if every man was an island or every person was an island, I would argue it doesn't matter what people believe, but but it produces actions. It affects national policies. And ultimately, that's why I think we have to be wary about about the impact of organized religion. But the one thing on which we perhaps differ is I think there are other strains that can develop Oh, yeah, no, look, I mean, the point is, I mean, Martin Luther King's an example. I mean, you can use, I mean, religion's been used for lots of... And so is liberation theology. But it's a very interesting development because it did lead to a war against the church with many religious martyrs. That's that's an interesting And forgotten. Yeah, that's interesting Who can even name the Latin American intellectuals who had their brains blown out? Yeah. None. None. You can name every dissident in Eastern Europe, but not these guys who we killed. In this regard, when we talk about um, we talk about dangers of, say, uh, uh, evangelical terrorism, um, and, and versus the the threat of Islamic terrorism, which which uh, we we both argue, but I've certainly argued at one point or another in terms of the day to day life of Americans 
is not a, a big deal. We've both been attacked, but particularly, um, I was dismayed by uh, um, by by Sam Harris's uh, uh, virulent attack uh, uh, to some extent. You, because I know Sam and I've worked with him in different ways. But the one statement he made that 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 concerned me um, it was a statement that I was surprised when he said that Ben, you know, he would prefer Ben Carson, someone who clearly is so. No concept of how the world works. No concept of science. Well, he has a he, sense, but he, 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 <laughs> he knows how poor people ought to be treated. Yeah. We, okay. Yeah, but he, but you know, he says that science is the work of the devil. That climate change, everything is, the, you know, that evolution is the work of the devil. But, but Sam, who's a, you know, it otherwise in, in my mind, many it said many reasonable things. It said he'd prefer him as president versus you because at least he understands the threat of his Islamic terrorism. And I. That's a statement that concerns me, so I, I thought I'd bring it up because... Uh, well, let's take the threat of Islamic terrorism. Mm -hmm. Let's look at the history. Mm -hmm. Islamic terrorism, the modern period, it begins basically in Egypt mm -hmm. against the government in the yeah. 1970s. It was, a, it was an internal uh, Middle Eastern phenomenon until, basically until the reaction to 9-11. The reaction to 9-11. At that point, Islamic terrorism was pretty much confined to a tribal area mm -hmm. in, uh, in the Pakistan-Afghan border, mm -hmm. the region where Al-Qaeda was sheltered. Now, that was the center of Islamic terrorism. Uh, what, where is it now? Everywhere in the world. Yeah. How did that happen? We did it. Uh, the invasion of Iraq, yeah, intelligence sure. agencies predicted across the board, this is going to increase terrorism. Uh, turns out by U.S. government records that uh, t Islamic terrorism increased by a factor of seven after the Iraq war. Yeah, you smash people in the face, they react somehow. It, yeah. And now it's all over the world. Every time you, you go after it, it's like a hydra, you know, yeah. create more. Yeah. You carry out the drone attacks in uh, northwest Pakistan or Yemen, uh, somebody sees their family blown up by something. Mm -hmm. You think they like it? Okay, how do they react? And in fact, uh, if you want to think about this in some depth, there's another book I'd recommend, great book, by uh, William Polk, who's a uh, fine uh, uh, a scholar of uh, mainly Middle East uh, Islamic studies, but also has a strong background in the... Uh, in the government. He was on the National Security Council mm -hmm. for Middle East Affairs, right through the Cuban Missile Crisis, in fact. He's the guy who sort of organized for the, uh, the negotiations between Israel and Egypt. Very important background, and a very smart and interesting guy. He has a book called uh, Crusaders and Jihadis. Uh -huh. It's a very interesting book covering a thousand years of history, from the Crusades to the present. and. What he points out is that this is largely a war of the North against the South, and a large part of the South is the Islamic South. It's a war in which the North has continually attacked the South brutally, viciously, destructively. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the Islamic world has f tried all sorts of ways to respond, uh, mm -hmm. negotiations, accommodation, one thing or another. Everything's been smashed down. Uh, finally, they've turned to uh, Islamic terror. Okay? That's, his that's real history, the kind you have to think about. It's not history is bunk. Well, it's also, but it's not, it's not untrue that in some sense, from a religious perspective, there is a religious justification that is used in the Islamic world for violence. Well, I take, a, the, I the, take, the, a, careful, be... take a careful look at that. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, there's been a lot of careful study of the jihadi sure. groups. Uh, Scott Atron. Uh, yeah, groups. I know Scott. Yeah. Okay, you know, uh, mm -hmm. what, they point, what he and others point out is that the Islamic element of it is very thin. Yeah, yeah. Most of the militant jihadis have just have essentially no Islamic background. They picked it up yeah, after the commitment. Okay, but the commitment comes from other things. It's the kind of things that William Polk is talking about, and the repression and so on, or even just things like peer pressure. Well, what I wanted to argue is that there's nothing new about that. In some sense, 
they're a newer religion, but the Crusades were 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 Christian Vicious. Crusades, but they were political. Just oh, they were, and what's they, more, they were hideous terror. Of, they, they were hideous the terror in exactly the same way, but it was 600 years earlier, 700 years earlier. Well, Islam's a religion that's 600 years younger. It's not too surprising. But but well, again, Islam there, has, there were political it has its own its own its own history of violence. Yeah, of course. But the picture that Polk presents is fundamentally correct. It is a north-south war, thousand years. The north wins all the time. It beats back now and then, and it just gets more and more violent and destructive. That's a persistent theme. Can't forget that. Well, let's let's <laughs> let's continue with. I, I want to try and conclude. Well, we uh, in a, in a few minutes, uh, we could go on for a long time. But I want to I want to go back in terms of um, this thrilling and uplifting theme we have of violence and destruction. It seems um, uh, to to the book by Daniel Ellsberg, uh, uh, the Doomsday Machine. I think it's called. A well, that's bit. a incredibly important book. Should yeah. be written. Yeah, and some of the things in it are really startling. Um, this is his discussion of things he discovered when he was right on the inside, uh, starting in the 50s. And incidentally, as he points out, he was a hawk. He believed it all, you know, it's just appalled by the things he was discovering. Uh, one of them was that the PSYOPs, you know, the, uh, the, the strategic plans for nuclear weapons called for killing 600 million people if we decide, yeah. you know. Yeah, it was amazing. Uh, the targeting, the structure was such that if there was a confrontation in Berlin, we would wipe out China, Yeah, literally. Why? Because we can do it. You know, China's vulnerable. We've got all these ships and missiles there. So if the Russians do something in Berlin, we'll wipe out China, you know. Yeah. And, uh, and, and this was just, this is not the hawks. This is everybody right through. Probably still the case. Then comes his discovery that under Eisenhower, uh, the uh, the uh, author authority to use nuclear weapons was subdelegated under Eisenhower to admirals and generals. But the logic was, well, if the top gets decapitated, somebody else has to do it. And that logic happens to proliferate. So if it goes down to generals, what if they get killed? Okay, you have to permit it down to lower levels. Turns out it was all the way down to pilots. Uh, if you look at the memoirs in the, uh, of the Cuban Missile Crisis, people who are flying the so-called Chrome Dome missions, with yeah. B-52s were all over the place ready to wipe out the world, you know, at the shot of an arm. Uh, the commanders of a... A B-52 plane could have decided to do it. Now, in theory, it took two of them to agree. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Suppose one of them was asleep or something. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I mean, it's just mind-boggling. Well, Stanley Kubrick and, was. <laughs> and as he points out, you know, Herman Kahn yeah. uh, fantasized about doomsday machines, but yeah. we have it. Yeah. The system is a doomsday machine. If anything goes wrong, you just blow up the world. And uh, once we've learned about nuclear winter you know you can debate the details but something's there well it's it's really it's it's particularly serious i think for americans who think that i mean who become complacent about nuclear weapons but think well probably the the most dangerous place where nuclear weapons might be used is india pakistan where there really are two states that really are yeah. at war that really hate each other that both are nuclear states and what what is important to f point out is that is that it's not isolated that a mere use of 200 nuclear weapons in in india and pakistan will produce a climate change that will uh, pre done. probably kill a billion people in terms yeah. of the uh, agriculture yeah. over the course of a decade. So there is no, it's there's not nothing. as if a local, there's not no even a local, wor local. It's not war. even an option. Yeah. You, know, you can't think about it. Yeah. And uh, meanwhile, the Trump administration is escalating the threat. Uh, the so-called uh, low yield nuclear weapons. I mean, you know, who, the people who can think about this, you can't even imagine what's in their minds. Suppose you're the opponent and somebody launches a, 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 a missile which you say has only low-yield nuclear weapons on it. Yeah. How do they know? You know they're going to react with by, by massive violence and you're yeah, done. Yeah, you know? no, I, no, I mean, I'm the like, idea oh. of, of usable nuclear weapons is a fallacy. I mean, and it's a, unfortunately the notion that if they're small enough, they're they're indistinguishable from 
we we have to overcome that. But that's the, uh, as far as I can see, that's a myth that's happening now. And that's why the, the Ellsberg book, I think, is important because it, it points out people have become complacent because we've had 75 years of not using them against civilian populations. But and you took a look at the record. Yeah. We've come so close. Close. Well, oh, so there's close, that one, the Command and Control, a wonderful book about, about how close we've come yeah. to domestically and in, internationally yeah. to... It, and, I mean, and it's not going to last. That case. luck is not going to last forever. I mean, there case after case we've come yeah. within a couple of minutes of using them. Well, look. Before we do go to a different area, I want I, I because I know, um, uh, particularly I know because your wife was interested in who's from Brazil wanted us to talk about Brazil a little bit. Let's let's talk about it a little bit. Well, Brazil, remember, is the most important country in the hemisphere outside mm-hmm. the United mm-hmm. States. It's not a small country. It's been called a uh, hundred years ago. It yeah. was called the Colossus of the South, potentially. Yeah. So what's happened in Brazil recently? I won't go through the whole history, yeah. of course, but just recently, uh, in uh, 2003, uh, they elected uh, Lula da Silva uh-huh. uh, president. He's a uneducated uh, union leader, a very f- a remarkable person. I knew him back in the 90s. Follow him closely. He's, very remarkable person, uh, very effective. You don't take my opinion. Uh, the World Bank published a study of uh, Brazil in 2016, mm-hmm. May 2016, uh, in which they discussed what they called the Golden Decade, a unique period in Brazil's history under Lula's two terms, 2003 to 2011, uh, a period in which there was remarkable uh, uh, improvement, uh, poverty reduction, enormous poverty reduction, uh, ex- large expansion of ex- inclusiveness, uh, marginalized. Po- Remember, these are very unequal countries, yeah. rich but incredibly unequal, enormous poverty, tremendous resources yeah. wasted, uh, inclusion of uh, people, uh, Afro-Brazilians, almost half the population, indigenous people and women brought into educational institutions, a sense of dignity, of commitment. The country just changed. They say it's a remarkable example of uh, development rarely equaled. At the same time, Lula became probably the most respected statesman in the world, a very respected statesman as a voice for the global south, respected everywhere. I remember visiting Brazil. It seemed like, yeah, it seemed okay. like the well, a, a beacon. Yeah, it was in a remarkable period. Well, uh, Brazilian elites couldn't tolerate this. And not only the... Pro- First of all, he was very supportive of establishment institutions. He didn't bu- um, interfere with didn't the wealth robbing yeah. the country. You yeah. know, he didn't. He paid off the debts to the foreign investors. He satisfied the IMF. Uh, he's not a radical. Yeah. I mean, his beliefs pretty straight are you just put money in the hands of poor people. That'll take care of things. That's his radicalism. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the, for the Brazilian elite who are outlandish, uh, all the Latin American elite, this is intolerable. Furthermore, there's enormous class hatred. Uh, how can this uneducated uh, worker who doesn't even speak proper Portuguese uh, dare to be uh, sitting in the presidential palace, you know, we can, these people have to have humility, uh, we'll take care of them, that sort of thing. That's deeply rooted all throughout Latin America, uh, and Brazil in particular. Anyhow, as soon as he, uh, after, a couple of years after he stepped down, the oil prices dropped and the commodity prices dropped with yeah. China cutting back yeah. development. There's a lot of claims that the improvements under uh, his uh, rule were just uh, illusory. They had, yeah. But the World Bank didn't agree. You look at their analysis, they say that's not true. Uh, in fact, if you look more closely, I've written about this, the and Brazilian economists have written about it. The, it was the mainly the predatory financial institutions who prevented any sensible reaction to this. Every effort that was taken was beaten back, and it did lead to a recession. That gave the opportunity for the soft coup that's been going on since then. The first step was to impeach his successor, Dilma Rousseff, on absolutely derisory grounds. I mean, you look at them, it's not even a joke. And she was impeached by a gang of thieves, Mm 
uh, the, of a sort you can't even describe. Now, that was the first step. Then comes the next. Just a couple months ago, uh, there was an election coming up in October, October mm. 2018. Lula was way ahead in the polls. It was pretty clear he was going to win the election. So what they do, put him in jail, solitary confinement, 25-year sentence, basically a death sentence, prevented from reading newspapers and journals, and crucially, prevented from making a public statement. Not like murderers and death row. Yeah. This is right before the election. Next step, which is, uh, we should look closely because it's a test run for the 2020 election here, yeah. a massive campaign on the social media, which are the main source of information for most of the population. The press is, of course, mostly right wing, but yeah. these are. But the media campaign is just unbelievable. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the lies, the fabrications, the vitriol, you know, the, the workers' party, his party is planning to turn every all the boys into homosexuals. It's going to kill religion. Uh, they're going to uh, put out baby bottles with uh, penises as the uh, nipples, you know, uh, on and on like this. Uh, people believed it, you know. They finally manage just by these means, you know, shut up, silence the guy who's going to probably going to win, uh, flood uh, the so-called information system with grotesque lies and uh, attacks that can't be responded to. And remember, we're going to see this soon. We're starting to see it already. This is test run. Uh, they manage to get into office a guy who's the most outrageous of the right-wing fanatics all over the world. Now, just to illustrate, uh, this is a guy who, when he, he was in the parliament, when he voted for the impeachment of Dilma Rousseff, mm -hmm. he dedicated his vote to her torturer. She was a guerrilla tortured by the military regime. He dedicated his vote to her torturer, the general who was in charge of the torture. Yeah. Uh, he supports the military dictatorship which was vicious, mm -hmm. but with but he criticizes it too, because it didn't go far enough. He said it should have it should have it was too soft. They should have killed thirty thousand people, like the Argentines did, the worst of the military yeah. dictatorships. Yeah. He goes back to the nineteenth century, and crit criticizes the Brazilian cavalry, because they didn't do what the Americans did, wipe out the indigenous population. If they'd done that, we wouldn't have these problems today. Uh, in fact, now that he's in office, uh, first of all, he's, his economics advisor is a ultra-right Chicago boy, Pablo yeah. Guedes. His motto is literally privatize everything, sell the country out to mostly foreign investors. Uh, kill, right now they're killing the social security system, which is not that strong, but something. Uh, uh, ha hand everything over to the rich and the powerful. Uh, the newest legislation is uh, change the history books so that they don't criticize the military dictatorship. They say it was necessary to protect the country from communism. Uh, he says the whole country has been taken over by what's called cultural Marxism, including the right-wing press, uh, the universities. We've got to block that. Science is finished. We don't support that. We don't waste money on that kind of stuff. So, so the Brazilian science is pretty powerful, interesting thing. It was People upcoming. In. So, I mean, uh, this is just indescribable. And it's happening in the most powerful country, important country in uh, Latin America, one of the most important in the world, with the strong support of the United States. Very powerful. In fact, this media campaign, you can't prove it, but it has all the fingerprints of... Uh, the people have been running these things elsewhere. Well, let's, let's, I want to try, I was going to get to linguistics, which you're not going to get to, but look, we've, pres this has been a sobering conversation in many ways, but I wanted to end by, by talking about your balance. I mean, we didn't get to talk much about science a little bit, but, but, uh, you've devoted m much of your life to writing. Your popular writing has been, <laughs> 
Other than interviews with you, your popular writing has been primarily on issues that we've been talking about now. Whereas your your scientific writing and linguistics has not been, you have, as far as I know, spent a lot of time on popular books and linguistics. Okay, and so mm, and, and I want and so I wanted to talk about that balance as someone who also does science and has written about science and and writes about it. This balance to ask you why whether you feel I've often people often ask me if you've felt compromised because one takes away from the other. Uh, and and I have my own answer to that, but I wanted to hear about yours. Whether you felt that the the, the efforts you've re- devoted to to exposing what you view as, uh, as 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 fundamental problems that need to be addressed for society has has of course compromised potentially the time you could have spent on linguistics and philosophy, and how you feel about that. If the world would go away, I'd be much happier just to keep to the scientific um, philosophical issues. Uh, that's really intellectually exciting. Uh, uh, frankly, these issues we're now talk- we've been talking about are pretty superficial. It doesn't take much to figure them out and understand them. There's nothing profound about it. Uh, you don't have to have a PhD in uh, political science to talk about these things. Uh, the, the guilds try to protect themselves, but the fact of the, and it's not a criticism yeah. of the fields. I mean, they're yeah. they're just too complicated. Yeah. So you, things are complicated. You don't get deep theories. I mean, physics is lucky. Yeah. If things get too complicated, just hand it over to the chemists. Yeah, yeah. That's right. But, that's what uh, I told people. That's why I do <laughs> physics. It's the easy stuff. But uh, you can't do that with uh, human life. You know. So, so it's, but but the point is, anybody can understand these things if they want. It's not intellectually exciting. It's humanly significant, and it's. There's a lot of frustration because you know that what you're going to do is going to be smashed and slaughtered in the mainstream with tons of lies and attacks. There's all kind of evidence about this. I won't go into it. So in a way, it's you know it's, it's kind of like wasted in a sense, except for the whatever effect it may have for the public. So if it's wasted, why have you do it? Then it? Because I think it's just critically important. Oh. So like take say the Vietnam War, uh, when Kennedy started escalating the war. I really had, I remember a personal decision. Nobody cares about this. Uh, Am I going to start trying to do something about it? Or can I keep to my work, which was at a very exciting period at the time? I was a young person, department developing, all kind of new ideas. Uh And I I knew perfectly well from experience, I have an activist history, that you put your one toe in, and pretty soon you're swimming. Yeah. You can't yeah. just do a lot. Yeah, in for a penny, in for a pound. I just decided it's got to be done, you know. It, it looked hopeless at the time. As I mentioned before, it took years before you could even talk about these things. But uh, they're just too important to let go. In I fact, think... uh, Bertrand Russell was asked once uh, around the 19, late 1960s uh, why he's wasting his time on anti-nuclear activities when he could be producing more serious work in philosophy and logic. And he said, uh, if I don't work on the nuclear activities, nobody's going to look at philosophy and logic. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I think, I mean, you said it before, it looked hopeless in the Vietnam War, and and ultimately it wasn't. It was really social. It was really the raising of consciousness about about, about that war that ultimately forced the people. Notice that it's dual. It was effective among the population, among the intellectual classes, basically zero. But yet they can't go beyond. It was a mistake. You know? Well, I, yeah, but I nevertheless, I think the lesson from this is, and we've spent two hours now talking about, largely talking about problems that will depress people, and there's serious problems in the world today. But the fact that you chose, that you chose to devote much of your life and time. To so at least talking about these issues, raising consciousness, pointing out that people could understand them, and that's the first step to action, is incredibly important. And I think that's why I feel I'm, I'm happy we were able to spend this time. And I think the world, it, we're lucky that you did that, and I'm hoping that we will continue our conversations and people who agree or disagree will at least be motivated to ask the questions, simple questions about, about the world that need to be asked if we're going to if we're going to try and address the important challenges of the 21st century which are now global which as you said not are just nuclear weapons climate change we need to have these discussions and i and literally millions of people thank you for what you've done thanks a lot Noel. thanks
The Origins Podcast is produced by Lawrence Krauss, Nancy Dahl, Amelia Huggins, John and Don Edwards, and Rob Zepps. Directed and edited by Gus and Luke Holwerda. Audio by Thomas Amison. Web design by redmondmedialab.com. Animation by Tomahawk Visual Effects. And music by Rickolis. To see the full video of this podcast, as well as other bonus content, visit us at patreon.com slash originspodcast.